Welcome back to Diary of an Empath. Okay, so this episode, I have been getting a lot of requests on the narcissist. I know I did a previous episode on this, but I really wanted to dive deeper into this subject because I had so many questions and so many good reviews from the episode that we did do on the narcissist. So my next guest is a narcissist recovery expert. She's ICF certified and she's a trauma trained specialist. So please welcome Megan Doherty. Megan, thank you so much for joining me today. (laughs) Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. I've been looking forward to it. And yeah, I've been, I kind of stumbled on your page randomly. I, I, I I think I was going through something at the time and um, I wanted to get more information on really what narcissist recovery was, because I have a lot of clients that have dealt with it. I've dealt with it. And as an empath, we tend to attract narcissists like flies on shit. So I want to know what got you into this field? Was it something you personally went through or what, what attracted you to this field? Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, it was a lot of lived experience (laughs) with more narcissists than I am comfortable admitting. Um, But it was one major relationship, um, about a three-year relationship with a malignant narcissist. And like coming out of that relationship with CPTSD, a panic disorder, like all the physical and mental health issues, and, and understanding that like a lot of the people in the mental health field had no clue what like psychological abuse was, what narcissistic abuse was, had no clue how it shows up in your body and how to help me heal. So I basically had to figure it out on my own. I went on like a witch hunt on the internet trying to figure out like why I was having panic attacks every day. And I traced it back to the fact that I was being narcissistically abused. And, you know, my ex had a history of that also. Um, So on my hunt to figure out how to heal myself, I figured out that there wasn't a lot of information out there and there was a lot of people that were struggling with the same thing. So I started getting all my certifications and, you know, learning everything I needed to know to help people. I love that you bring that up because, you know, for those of you listening as a therapist, you know, or as anyone in the mental health field, we use something called the DSM. And it's kind of like the Bible of the mental health field with what we use to diagnose. And although it's great and it kind of gives you a guideline, it doesn't really go into details about the victims. How do we treat the victims? What is the abuse like for the victims? And when you're dealing with a narcissist, the pain and the mental and the physical and the emotional abuse can be so extreme. And a lot of mental health providers really don't know how to treat the victim. So let's start off with this. For those that are listening that have never been in a narcissistic relationship or maybe don't know how to recognize that, what is a narcissist? Yeah. So there's so many different types of narcissists, but there's a couple of there's a couple of cornerstones of narcissism. Like if you're in a relationship, you're going to see the lack of empathy. You're going to see entitlement, entitlement to to use you, whatever you have, your resources, attention, sex, money, everything. And you're also going to see a um, just a lack of like connection, a lot of criticism, um, a parasitic lifestyle where you feel like they're using you and soaking up all of your energy. Um, and yeah, most of the time, the cycle of narcissistic abuse starts out with like, love bombing. All right. Like that's why I focus so much on love bombing, like pulling you in, selling you the dream, future faking and all of that very quickly. Like before they they even get to know you, right. They want to get you hooked on them. So they sell you a story and then the devaluation stage starts. So that's when it's all the criticism, the abuse, it can be physical, mental, emotional, sexual, financial, all of that starts in the value stage and then the discard stage. So this discard stage, a lot of people get this confused. They think like, okay, he's just going to ghost me and leave me, or she's just going to ghost me and leave me. But this can be a process of keeping you trapped in the relationship while they're pushing you away at the same time and continue to break you down. Mm. So a lot of this stuff will show up in ways that a lot of people haven't connected to abuse before. Because as you were saying in the mental health field, even in the DSM, they don't acknowledge CPTSD, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder which happens over a stretch of time. Okay. So if you're in a relationship and you feel like you're constantly being like pushed to the edge, there's a lot of abuse going on. It may be covert in certain ways. Um, you're probably with a narcissist. So you mentioned that there were different forms of 
the narcissist. And I've heard of the covert type and other different forms. Can you go over just maybe what a few of the characteristics and the different types of a narcissist? Because it's not a one size fits all and it can be subjective. And and also is there traits versus an actual true narcissist? Yeah, so absolutely. So I always start off by saying narcissism exists on a spectrum. Okay, it can go from zero to about 10, which 10 is going to be a very overt, very malignant narcissist. Um, so it does exist on a spectrum, but when you're really low on the spectrum, that's just traits. So usually when we're talking about narcissistic abuse, we're not really talking about people that are very low on the spectrum because you don't see the identifiable cycle of narcissistic abuse present. Um, so the different types of narcissists, the two major categories are going to be overt and covert. So an overt narcissist is going to be what most of us can identify from a mile away, like grandiose, showboaty, like really into themselves, very crass. You know, they overtly tear people down. See them coming from a mile away. There's been some people like in the media and stuff like that, especially in the U.S. that are like the poster children for an overt narcissist. So most of us know what that looks like. So the other category is a covert narcissist. So covert narcissists move through kind of under the radar. And a lot of them lead with um, being victimized. So they come to you as the victim and needing help with the sob story and all of this. And you get, especially if you're an empath and you, you know, you, you love to fix people and you love to heal people, that's how you get caught up with an, an, a covert narcissist. So they do it, I call it like death by a thousand cuts. Like it's very kind of under the radar. Like they they use a lot of like microaggressions when they tear you down, a lot of criticism, but backhanded. And then when you confront them about it, then it's like, I didn't say that. You're too sensitive. That never happened. You know, they may use the gaslighting to even deny that they're being like crass or or um or mean or abusive. Okay. So that's the second category. And then there's a lot of subcategories. So there's like a somatic narcissist that just leads with their physicality, right? That just seduces people. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different kinds, but those are the most, like those are the prominent categories of, of narcissism. Yeah, and you know what sticks out to me is the covert type because I feel like that's the really dangerous one. Oh, yeah. That's the yeah. one you don't see coming. And I think that as empaths and as you mentioned that we naturally want to fix people, we want to heal people. And we think that, and, and I, I want to go back to the love bombing too, because when mm-hmm. you get out of that love bombing stage, you're like, well, what happened to this person who was showering me with love and now they're doing all these things. I just want to get back to that. So I want to go back to the love bombing and the gaslighting. You mentioned that. And I know with the cycle of abuse, a lot of times it's the honeymoon stage and then the buildup stage and then the explosive stage. So there's a lot of similarities that I see with the cycle of abuse and the narcissist relationship. And I think with empaths too, because you mentioned we're natural healers. So we often want to empathize and we're so understanding of the person's past and maybe their traumas. And I, for me, I know when I was in a narcissist relationship and I've actually been in two of them, I would go back to that love bombing phase to be like, what happened to that person who was showering me with love? So for those that are listening, I really want to have them get an idea of what love love bombing looks like and what does gaslighting look like for those that might be Mm -hmm. questioning a relationship that they're currently in. Yeah. Love bombing is such, it's the most important part of the narcissistic abuse cycle. I say this all the time. It is the part that keeps you dialed in. They're dangling the carrots. So they start off, comes in really fast, really heavy with, you know, promises of a future, future faking, marriage, um, very early on before they they even get a chance to know you. Um, it could be gift giving. It can be just putting you on a pedestal. You're the best person that I've ever met. All of these promises that are just like, there's no genuine anchor to them because they don't know you yet. So what they do is they move through the world trying to get people dialed in and addicted as soon as possible. So that's the love bombing. So if you ever feel like you've met somebody and, you know, people aren't the only people that do this. This is organizations use love bombing also, the ones that want to get people like dialed in and and really devoted to them as well. It's just a system that they run off of. So during the love bombing phase, um, it's really a phase where they just hijack all your happy hormones. Okay, so you're completely like devoted to them as far as like feeling good. You know, they're going to build you up to a place that we call idealization, which you can't really reach. There's no like genuine anchor to that. So that's how that starts out with the love bombing. 
And you could always like, if you're an empath and you're very intuitive, looking back on it, you could always feel like this doesn't feel right. This person doesn't even know me. Like, how do they feel this strongly about me when they haven't even like, it's two days in, you know, you'll hear a lot of like, I love you on the second day, or I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Like when, within the first week, I want to have kids with you, all of these things. And that's just to get you really hooked on that promise. Okay. So the more when they start to devalue you, when the abuse starts, you're, you're really like tied into that, that future that they paint it for you. So that's the whole purpose of love bombing. And they do it periodically, like through, through the relationship as well. So a lot of people think that it just starts out like that at the beginning. And that person goes away. But the thing with about narcissists is that they know how to turn the love bombing back on when they need to breadcrumb you and like give you a reason to not leave. Okay. So that's going to happen throughout the relationship. And again, I think it's the most important part of narcissistic abuse because if they were an asshole, a hundred percent of the time you would leave, you know, so that is very, very important. Um, and it usually is what, what causes what we call cognitive dissonance, like conflicting thoughts and beliefs. So a lot of people, you know, when it comes to people that stayed in relationships with narcissists, other people will be like, well, why did you just leave? If somebody was treating me like that, like I would just leave. But what they don't see is a very covert love bombing that's happening behind the scenes that keep you, to keep you there, right? To keep you giving them like second, third, a hundred chances. Um, and then gaslighting that happens throughout the cycle of abuse also. So basically during the phases where they are abusing or are whether covertly or overtly, um, whether they're being like disloyal and because most of them usually are serial cheaters. Right. Um, and you find out about this stuff and they have to use gaslighting. They have to get you to doubt your own thoughts. They have to get you to doubt your own memory. Like that never happened. You could see proof. You could see text messages, emails, all of these things. And they have to get you to really doubt that you ever saw it. Right. So they're just painting you another picture to kind of like deconstruct your reality. And so that's what gaslighting, that's what gaslighting is. And that's how it shows up in the relationship for the most part. Oh, I got goosebumps because this just brought back so many memories for me. And a a, a key thing that you pointed out is, especially if you're an empath, your intuition, I can guarantee you is either going off or has gone off in the past. If you look hindsight, a lot of times with these narcissists, you will end up feeling drained and feeling like, like, I want to bang my head against a fucking wall. Like, am I going crazy? Because I know for me, there were times when I saw the stuff right in front of me. I saw the gaslighting and it was just almost too much too quickly. And then when I would call this person out, like, okay, you know, well, I, you say that you care for me, but yet I see that you're following like 5,000 strippers on your <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> yeah. And then, oh, you're just insecure. Like what? No, mm-hmm. any, any normal woman would feel like this. And thank God I'm in a place now where I understand how to recognize it, but that took time and that took growth Mm -hmm. and it took a lot of work. But, you know, I've also been in relationships back in my twenties. I remember one, um, particularly where it was the covert type and it was the serial cheater and just this Mm -hmm. revolving cycle of the love bombing and the gaslighting, the love bombing and the gaslighting. And it takes such a toll on you and you really do question your reality. And I'm so glad Mm -hmm. that you brought up that point. Mm -hmm. So I also want to ask you, is there something that causes this? Is there childhood trauma? Mm -hmm. Is there something linked to why people end up being a narcissist? And is there a link to maybe people who end up in narcissistic relationships? Yeah, absolutely. So as far as the psychology books are concerned, there's a little bit of misinformation out there. People think that all narcissists are forged through childhood trauma. Like they had to have had this horrible childhood with their abuse. And, you know, if you have empathy, of course you have empathy for that. Right. Um, but that's not actually the case. Okay. So there's a lot of narcissists that were actually raised by permissive parents that spoiled them. Okay. And just different nature versus nurture. Sometimes it's, you know, genetic. They have a narcissistic or a sociopathic person. And they were never a abu- parent and they were never abused when they were younger. And yet that these narcissistic traits start to solidify when they're young and they grow up into a full blown, blown narcissist. So it's not always childhood trauma. There are some situations where, you know, yeah, they were abused when they were younger. Um, they weren't properly like emotionally attuned to. 
Um, They had parents that were either neglectful where they had to like fend for themselves. And so they had this very um, strong, like self-protective program that they, they run off of. And that turns into narcissism because they have, they, they can't introspect. It's all about like their own safety, their own validation. And in the process, they tear other people down and they don't know how to regulate their own emotions. So what they're pretty much doing is projecting what's going on inside of them onto everybody that's around them. Okay. So there's a, there's a lot of nuance to the conversation. There's not one way that a narcissist is like, you know, made. And that's important to say also, especially when we're talking to impasse, because the first thing that all of us will say, I've been there, right? And most of my clients have as well. We'll say like, I feel so bad for them. I feel so bad for them. They must have had a horrible childhood, you know? And so you're like, well, maybe I can fix them. Maybe I can heal them. So it's important to, to, to note that that's actually a misconception that, that you do not have to, um, there, there isn't always childhood abuse when it comes to, to narcissists, okay? Some of them have great lives and they're just spoiled. Um, so yeah, definitely like keeping that in mind when it comes to, you know, if you're in a situation where you feel stuck with a narcissist and, and you have having cognitive dissonance, like, should I stay? Should I help them heal? There's no amount of you giving them love and stuff that they don't actually register. That's going to help them change. And it's a very fixed personality disorder as well. So they don't recover. That's really powerful. And I will say that out of the clients that I've had in the past, that has been majority of my experience. And usually when they come to therapy, it's because they've been forced into therapy in some way, but it's in very rare, rare, rare circumstances that Mm -hmm. change occurs. And I'm just going to be honest. And, you know, really quick story time. I was with, uh, I wouldn't say I was with him. I was talking to a guy like maybe back in January and really good looking guy. And he came up to me very assertive and confident And it was at the gym and I usually do not date guys at the gym at all, but he was a good looking guy. And he asked me for my phone number. I gave it to him. And very quickly, he was asking questions that were very personal, very get to know you. And at first I liked that. I was like, oh, wow, look at these questions. He's asking like, is he Googling these questions? Because I I was stumped on some of these questions, like really deep childhood you know, what's your relationship like with your dad and what happened with this and what happened with that very early on. And so then I started to notice that his childhood was very victimized. He was in foster care and this and this and this happened. Then I found out he lied about his age. Then I found out he didn't have a car. And I'm like, in my regular mind, I was like, Carice, what are you doing? (laughs) But at that (laughs) point, the intimacy had already happened. And that's how I got hooked in, right? Because of course, the sex was good. And I'm like, okay, well, you know what? Let me just see. I'll I'll take it a little further against my better judgment. It had been a while. (laughs) So I'm like, I'm just going to keep going. Just let let it play out. But then Mm -hmm. I would notice he would do the love bombing. You're you're my soulmate and you're this and you're that. And then I broke it off. Flowers were sent to me. You're my other half and you're this and you're that. I'm like, well, yeah, you're saying that, but you have like 5,000 strippers on your Instagram. And I just started noticing things. My intuition was going off. And you mentioned, pay attention to your intuition. I felt so drained around this person. But then there was a part of me that's like, I I can understand that he's in survival mode because of his childhood trauma, because of this, and because of all this stuff that happened to him. But then I would notice the gaslighting. So when I would say, okay, well, you say this, but your actions are showing otherwise because you're following this many girls. You lied to me about this. You're in this area of your life, and this is where I'm at in my life. And then the gaslighting would start. Oh, you're just being insecure. You're just, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm 36 years old. I know what I want. I'm not insecure. But I think that it's because I've had a lot of growth in my life and I'm at the mm-hmm. age where I'm at now that I've been able to recognize this. But had this have been 10 years ago, I probably would have stayed in that situation for much longer than what mm-hmm. I should have because I think the situation was only five weeks. So here's the thing, as empaths, you're still going to meet narcissists, but the key, at least in my opinion, is recognizing the red flags early. And if you recognize the red flags, do not stick around for them. Would you agree to that? 100%. Yeah, 100%. That's that's so important to know. It's like, especially as women, right? We're going to attract men in general, right? You, it's not like you're attracting a certain type. It's like, who are you allowing to stay? Like once you meet them and the red flags start going off, are you using your discernment? Are you are you overriding your intuition or are you listening to it? Right. 
because there'll be those signs. And I think it's, I love that you told that story because that is actually an archetype of a narcissist. So my ex met at the gym, you know, weightlifter, bodybuilder, this kind of thing. A lot of them are that, right? So they're hiding that, you know, their, their emotional fragility in their, in their muscles, basically. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them are like that. My ex is the same way meet you at the gym, you know, start showering you with all of this praise. You're the best person I ever met. And there was a really important thing that you said about asking questions very early on, like some very deep personal questions. So this is textbook pathology of narcissists. So what they do is they try to gather as much information about you as they possibly can. So they'll know where your weaknesses are, what your core wounds are, to ask you what your relationship is with your father is like, is there a void there? Can I feel that? You know what I mean? Are there weaknesses there that I can play off of? And they will use that the longer, you know, that was five weeks for you. But the longer you stay in, in the relationship, they will use that stuff, throw it back in your face. And they'll also use it as leverage to keep you addicted to them. Okay. So, and this is a process called mirroring. So the, the narcissist will mirror you at the beginning, ask you as many questions as you possibly can. And if you're like, you know, obviously we don't, our brains don't, don't, don't operate like that. So we're thinking, oh my God, they're very like in tune with me. They're very interested. They're holding space for me. You know, they're gathering information so they can use it at a later date. So that's exactly mm-hmm. what happens in probably a hundred percent of relationships with narcissists. They come in just like that. You think that they're really, you know, emotionally intelligent and they're very like in tune and empathic and, and they're not at all. They, they know how to imitate um, cognitive empathy just so they can get what they want, get all the information about you that they can. I have goosebumps because (laughs) it's so true. It's so everything that you said is so true. And unless you've been through that, it's hard to conceptualize that somebody would be like that. But there really are people out there that are like that. And that's exactly what this person was doing. He was gathering information And it was so intense. And I look back at that. I'm like, wow, what a scary situation. And to even go further into that story, I'm not usually one to do background checks on this person, but I'm like, you know, I'm prior military. I'm also prior law enforcement. I'm like, I want to see what's going on with this person. I'm just curious. And this guy had um, strangulation, domestic violence, all this crazy stuff. And I was for the first time, I was like, this is, this is a lot. This, I have to block this person on every side. I have to completely separate myself from this person. And he still, for at least two months, reached out on every platform. Then he would hit me up on another number, send paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs. Because you know what? I'm sure that's worked with other people in his past. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you have to really trust your intuition as an empath, especially if you're some someone that's sensitive. And I love how you say that it's not necessarily because we're going to attract people. And I hate the saying when they, when people say like, oh, well, maybe you should look at why you're attracting these people. No, you're always going to attract people like this. You're a healer. They're attracted to your light because we're so compassionate and understanding. You are the easiest victim for the narcissist Mm -hmm. because of how compassionate you are. You're going to attract these people, but you can also attract healthy people as well. So it's all about you utilizing your intuition, trusting your intuition, making good decisions and not staying in situations that you know are not healthy for you. So yeah. I actually have a question from a listener. And um, if I may, I want to ask this question and, and see what your thoughts are on this. Yeah. So she says, I have a very good friend that was married to a narcissist for a long time and he would critique her weight a lot while they were together. It's been a few years and she still struggles. And she still struggles with her confidence around her body. Any advice and what can we do if we are on the sidelines and we see a friend or a family member in a narcissistic relationship? Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm so sorry to hear that she's experiencing that. Like, you know, the whole body shaming element when it comes to narcissists, whatever they can do to keep you under their thumb and to keep you insecure about yourself so you won't leave them and understand that you deserve better. That's what they will do. So that's the process that is going on with her, what's going on with her friend. Um, There's a process of literally stepping back into your power and understanding that your self-esteem is separate from the messages that the narcissist was trying to project onto you, right? That's them trying to project 
their internal shame. They're very insecure, contrary to popular belief, right? They're very, very insecure. So what they show on the outside is to mask that insecurity. So what they do is they try to project the messages of their insecurity and their shame onto you. So that's happening. That was happening with her friend. So I would totally say, like, just get in there, get really clear on the messages that were theirs. You know, like they have to do this with everybody. It's not because of you. It's not a pure reflection of who you are. And start to just really build your self-esteem back up, you know, with self-care, taking care of yourself, taking care of your body, what feels good, you know, what doesn't, just really honoring yourself and, and starting to pour back into herself, okay? Because what they do is just strip you of all the energy that you have. So as a friend, um, it's a very tricky situation, but since she's left the narcissist, it gets a little easier. While you're in the relationship, if a friend comes from the outside, there's not a lot that can be done other than them holding space. Um, because if you're, you know, gaslit and your brain changes while you're in this, these relationships and the narcissist using coercive control will get you to push your friends away and, you know, start dropping C's on, you know, why they're not good for you and all of the, these things to isolate you. So now that she's out of that relationship, I would say try to be a clear mirror for her, like mirror back the things about her that that, that you love about her, like why, why you're her friend, like the beautiful things that you see in her and just be like a clear mirror because there's a distorted mirror that she was in front of for all those years that she was with her narcissistic ex. So yeah, just holding space and being just like mirroring all the good qualities about her and, you know, helping her get back to a place where she feels in her power. That's a beautiful response. I love the mirror analogy. Being with a narcissist, you're looking through a clouded mirror and that mirror is not clear and it may not be the mirror that other people see. So really enforcing those positive attributes in the friendship that you have with this person. I know a girl who um, just randomly reached out to me on Instagram a couple months ago and she was in a narcissistic abusive marriage and she's probably listening right now. And um just a sweet girl, really beautiful girl. And she just randomly reached out to me and said, Hey, I really look up to you. And I'm just going through this situation. And she ended up packing her bags that night and left and went to her parents' house in another state. And she, I'm so proud of her. And she yeah. left that situation. But, you know, one of the things that she told me was that she felt so isolated. And one of the reasons she reached out to me is because she really didn't know who else to talk to. She mm -hmm. didn't know me. But she just felt this urge that she could maybe reach out to me and she would get some kind of response. But she had been isolated so much from her friends and family throughout the course of her marriage that she didn't feel comfortable enough to go to anyone because she had been isolated for so long. And maybe there was some guilt or some shame that was also attached to that. So when she finally was mustering up the courage to leave, she didn't know who to talk to. So right. I think that's beautiful advice, you know, to really just hold that space because you may not be able to change a situation, but they have to kind of come to those conclusions on their own, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that isolation is done by design. It is absolutely by design from the narcissist because if they can separate you from your support system, you have nobody to turn to, you're less likely to, to break free. You know, you don't know who to call and it does put a strain on your, your relationships that happened in my relationship. It, it put a strain on all of my the friends that I'd had for years, my family, you know, I felt very distant from them. And, you know, I don't know if they, how much they knew of what was going on, but I just felt like I couldn't reach out to him because he wouldn't let me be around them and all of that stuff. So they will literally isolate you, mm -hmm. um, physically and emotionally from your friends, family, and support system. If they can move you to a state where you don't know anybody, they'll do that as well. So I think that's so beautiful that she saw in you, you know, that you were able to hold space for her and, and that you were, you know, somebody that she can go to when she felt like she was ready to leave. So. Well, and little did she know is that I've been through this myself. A lot of people, mm -hmm. if you just look at my Instagram or you don't know me, you have no idea the things that I've been through. And I am I am the person I am today because of what I've been through and the growth and the healing that had to take place from those relationships. I remember being in a very, very traumatic, abusive relationship that was physically abusive, mentally abusive, mm -hmm. and all the above. And I remember going to my best friend, her name's Fee, and she was such a rock during this time because I remember even sending her 
Uh, oh God, it, it was so terrible. I remember sending her pictures of my black eye, pictures of the abuse that was going on. And I say, I said, fee save this just in case I need to use this. But I couldn't muster up the courage at the time to leave. And I don't know what it was. I, I felt so restricted and so lonely. And then the, then the love bombing would happen. And then I would think, oh, you know what? Maybe we can work this out. And we had a child together. So, you know, then take that on top of everything. And it made it even harder. So what about children? What happens when someone has a child with a narcissist? How do you cope with that? And how do you cope with somebody that you still have to have that relationship with because you have to co-parent? Because I know for me, when I finally mustered up the courage to leave, and I did, co-parenting was hard for a very, very long time. And it got to the point where I finally was like, you know what? You have no control over my life anymore. And when I did that, things changed. And we're actually really good right now. But it took years and years to get to that point and a lot of forgiveness. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but it took a lot of forgiveness. But for those that are listening, what what would your advice to be for those that are trying to co-parent and they're dealing with a narcissist? What do you do? Absolutely. Yeah. Co-parenting with a narcissist makes it, I mean, is one of the hardest things that you will ever have to do. There's one thing with getting yourself out of, out of the relationship and out of the trauma bond, which is important to note because, you know, you were saying like you were there and you couldn't figure out like why you wouldn't walk away. Like that's the trauma bonding, the cycle of abuse that's sprinkled in with intermittent reinforcement of the love bombing. Okay. So your brain is like, and your body biochemically is addicted to this relationship. So that's why it's so hard to leave first and foremost, because there's trauma bonding there. Secondly, yes, if you have a kid, it makes it a hundred times harder. Um, but there's a lot of resources now out there. Um, one of the biggest things is low to no emotional contact when it comes to a narcissist. So if you have a kid with them, you want to keep things as structured as possible. You want to, you know, have maybe a joint calendar. There's an app that I that I give to my my clients called My Family Wizard. And the purpose of this, a lot of courts actually um, they can get get a, you can get a mandate for it. Like this is the only way that we communicate. Is through this, depending on how abusive or volatile the relationship is. So it's called um, Our Family Wizard, I believe. Our Family Wizard or My Family Wizard, Our Family Wizard. Um, and so you go in there and then when it comes to visitation, everything is documented. When you're supposed to drop the kids off, how long they have them, any kind of money that's being used, you can put that in there and that's that's written down. Um, it can be supervised by a lawyer. All of these things, right? So there's really, there's things that you can put in place, but what you really need is structure. You need structure so there's not moments where gaslighting starts, um, the lying and, and the, the thing, they, they, they live off of emotional reactivity. So however you can take your power back and make sure things are as structured as possible, I say do that. And uh, what we call that is, um, it's a part of gray rocking. So if you've ever heard of gray rocking, the, the purpose of gray rocking is to make yourself as boring and as bland as a gray rock. So no like emotional reactivity, you know, don't like fall into their bits for, you know, to, to get you all like riled up and those kind of things. Um, If it has nothing to do with the children, we're not talking about it. Nothing new is going on in my life. Nothing exciting. Nothing that you can tear down. You just don't want to give them any fuel. OK, so and then that process you want to make sure that you're healing yourself, like literally healing yourself, healing your nervous system, um, taking back your life, like your confidence, your you know self-esteem and all of that. So you're strong enough to really protect your child and know and be very vigilant about if things are going on or going wrong in that household. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely the, the best advice that I can give to, to, to people that have a child with a narcissist. I have a lot of clients that do, and we strategically work through it because you definitely have to have a plan. I like that resource. I didn't know that was something that was available, but I think that's a great resource, especially to some of you listening who might be going through some of that, because I know communication can be a huge issue. And when you have a child with someone, it's almost like you feel like you don't have any control. You feel like this person has control over you. And I know I've often heard from people who are in narcissistic relationships that the other person, the narcissist will threaten them or threaten to take away their mm -hmm. children. And it's something that the other person takes very seriously or 
starts feeling very out of control or feels like, well, what if this can happen? And then start being more submissive to the things that the narcissist is asking for or wants. And again, they're, they need to get their fuel from somewhere. So mm-hmm. I think that that's really great advice to have the structure use the gray, is it gray rock? Use the gray rock method. Gray rock method. Yeah. Gray rock method and be as stone cold as you can. Just no emotions. I always tell people, treat them how you treat your coworkers. You're going to be with coworkers that you don't always like. So you got to keep it professional, right? Per yeah. my last email, <laughs> you got to do, keep it professional and just try to not give them an emotional reaction. And mm-hmm. I know for me, I would always go to my friend and just be like, Fee, I'm about to lose my fucking mind, but they don't know that. I'm just going to go to her with that. So if you have that one friend you can go to, utilize them. Yeah, so yeah. I have another question too, because from that same um, listener, they were asking, can the narcissist love their children? Are they capable of loving their spouse? Can they love? Or is it really just so much about them that they're not capable of loving? Yeah, so... This can be, this is a hard one. Um, again, narcissism exists on a spectrum, but when we're talking about those that are pretty high on the, the, on the spectrum, um, they don't have the capacity to love. They don't have the ability that you can't have love without empathy. So a low conscious disorder has impaired or zero empathy. So, so most of them don't, you know what I mean? Like most of them see their children as pawns and they'll use their kids to manipulate and they'll use their kids for narcissistic supply and to triangulate them with the other parent, with the empath and all of this. So most of them know, and you know, psychologically speaking, they, they don't know how to love. They know how to imitate love very well. Um, they know how to use the idea of love to get what they want, but they don't actually genuinely feel a very like heart centered, empathic love. That's sad. Um, like, yeah, it is really sad. Yeah. And even when it comes to, yes, children and spouses, one of the biggest hurdles when it comes to leaving the narcissist is acceptance. I have a workbook that talks about radical acceptance, accepting the fact that they never loved you because they don't have the capacity to. They were using you for narcissistic supply. And that's why they can just move on to the next person as quickly as they they met you and start love bombing the next person and start the cycle all over again. Because there is no love there, right? You can't just turn love off. Like, it's really hard for us to turn love off. But for them, no, because it was never there in the first place. They see you as a utility. So just like we have a phone, like how we use our phone for everything that we need. If it was the break, you know, we would get a new one. Or we put it down when we don't want it and pick it up when we need to use it. Like, that's how they see humans. And that's why they actually, most of the time, have multiple sources of supply going on at the same time. So that's why most of them are serial cheaters, because they need a revolving door of supply. So it's not about love. And it never is about love. Even marriage for them is is more of a contract. Wow, that is powerful. I I like the phone analogy, but that's almost scary to think about that, Mm -hmm. to be viewed as I'm a phone. How do you treat your phone? Like, oh, if it breaks, I'm going to go get a new one. I use it when I need there. It's there for my convenience. And it's, it's so true. It's true. But what about children? So do you think that they love their children? Do you think that they're capable of loving their children? I think that they, I think that there's a, something that feels similar to love and it depends on what type of, you know, narcissists there are. Like if they're a sociopath or more of a psychopath, they absolutely don't. Um, mm-hmm. And most malignant narcissists don't love their children either, you know? Um, yeah, in most cases they don't, they can't feel it. It's just not in there. They don't have the empathy. They don't have the ability to introspect. Um, and without that, you can't love. So no, most of them do just see their kids as, you know, an extension of them. You know, they, they see their kids as narcissistic supply also. Yeah. And so let's talk about healing and and leaving. So I know that there's some listeners that are listening right now and are in a relationship and are probably like, oh shit, this is hitting me and resonating so much. So if someone is in a narcissist relationship and they're trying to leave, what's your best advice for them to start making those decisions in order to move out of that relationship? And then once they're out of that relationship and they're starting the healing process, what are some steps that someone can take in order to start healing? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, One of the most important things if you're still in the relationship is start to plan. Have a plan. Um, Obviously, keep it to yourself. Don't have it in, you know, communal devices that they can see. Um, But have a plan. Um, Financial. uh, Have a financial plan. Start putting away money so you can, you know, get away. Um, Have support. So try to mend those bridges with your support system. Family that you can trust, friends that you can trust, start to mend that because it will help so much if you have somewhere to go and people that can really attune to you and be there when you're when you're leaving the narcissist because they've been your entire world, right? That's what they like to do. They isolate you. So first and foremost, if you're trying to get out, like make sure you have a support system. Don't try to do it on your own. Definitely reach out a coach, a therapist. Um, somebody that is trusted. So you have somebody there. Um, Secondly, I would say to start to regulate your nervous system and figure out like what, how it's showing up in your, your life currently. Okay. So it's going to be extremely nerve wracking, especially depending on, you know, how abusive the relationship was, whether or not the narcissist is physically threatening and all of those things. So you want to start pouring back into yourself and really regulating yourself around the idea of leaving and really getting clear, whether it's journaling or whatever the case is about this is the right decision. You know, like it may hurt temporarily because you're breaking that trauma bond. You're chemically addicted to this person. So it may hurt temporarily, but get really clear on what you're walking away from and what you're moving towards. Right. A life free of abuse to somebody maybe in the future that actually truly loves you and can really care for you and doesn't really, doesn't just care about themselves and narcissistic supply and sees you as a utility. Okay. So get really clear on what you're leaving and really clear on the fact that you will not allow the narcissist to suck you back in. Okay. So that's, I think that's first and foremost, because a lot of people, even people sometimes too come to me as a coach and And I honestly have to say, you know, I don't think you're ready to leave. Like, you know, you have to have a plan and you have to really know that this is the last time because a lot of times when you get sucked back in for a second, third, fourth time, the abuse gets worse and it gets more dangerous for you. So, yeah. Yeah, that's really powerful. I like what you said about the addiction qualities, because if you look at the structure in our brains, when we are addicted to something Or when we're doing something that's a reward system, we get these dopamine hits, you know, and and then when we're in the womb, we we release oxytocin. So that's that safety neurotransmitter. So all of these neurotransmitters are going crazy. That's Mm -hmm. keeping you sucked in, especially with the love bombing. And when you're not getting those dopamine hits, those oxytocin hits, those serotonin hits, you know, and then all of a sudden that disappears, you want that back. And you're going to do anything to get that back. So when that person cycles again and starts love bombing you again, and you're getting those neurotransmitters back and the serotonin's flooding and the oxytocin's flooding and the dopamine's coming in, you feel better again. And then you think, okay, well, maybe this can, can get better. So it even changes the structure in the brain. And there's something that happens that we call neuro, I think it's neuroplasticity. Mm-hmm. When you can teach your brain how to rewire itself, you can change the structure of how you do things and and the habits that you have. That's the beauty of the human brain, but it takes work and it can happen. So it's it's even more than just the relationship or the things that you're attracting. It really goes down to the chemical of of the the, the neurotransmitters in the brain and how that's affecting your decisions. I love 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 mm-hmm. that you brought that up. And so before we wrap up, I, I, I want to really quick touch on, I saw an Instagram post that you recently posted and I thought it was really powerful. And it was common quotes that you often hear from survivors. And I just want to read a couple of them out because I got goosebumps reading these. <laughs> My stomach was always in knots waiting for the other shoe to drop. My heart sank when I found out about all the betrayal and the lies. I felt like I constantly need to get something off my chest. I had a lump in my throat every time I tried to speak up for myself or set boundaries. My heart felt heavy as I grieved for the relationship and who I thought this person was in the beginning. And my favorite one, the circular conversations and the gaslighting made my head feel like it was about to explode. So do you feel like you see these common themes with your clients? Absolutely, 100%. 
And the reason why is because the body truly does keep the score. Like abuse and, and stress, being in chronic stress with a narcissist or an abusive person, it affects your body physically. You know, it affects your body and it will sit there. So trauma starts in the body. Your emotions start in the body. And that's why we find ourselves saying these things that we've normalized. And the reason why it was so important for me to highlight that is because when I work with clients, I do a bottom-up approach, okay? We're working with the trauma that's in your body because that's what trauma does. It fragments the mind and the body. So the healing process is a process connecting the mind back with the body. So you really have to start to figure out where in your body that trauma lies, where in your body, like these stress containers in your body. And so highlighting that was like, we say these things, like my heart was heavy, my heart sank, my stomach was in knots. So when you go to heal, you really have to start with the body. You absolutely have to start with the body and the nervous system because your body still feels like you're in imminent danger. And that's why we get out of these relationships for anybody that's still in it. You know, you, you may not know this yet, but like once you're out of the relationship, that's not just like, okay, I'm safe now. You know, I'm safe now. I'm away from them. Your body may still like still feel like you're in danger. Mm -hmm. And that's where anxiety, panic disorders, gut disorders, immune disorders, like that's where all of this comes into play. So I actually did a masterclass on Thursday that was about safety and embodiment. And it was really just like not not intellectualizing it, you know, not talking about your trauma from, you know, for for days and, and months and all of this stuff. It's great to get that off your chest. Right. But when it comes to really healing from it, you have to drop back into your body and let your body know that it's safe. So, yeah, that's really important to, to, to know. And, you know, especially if you're suffering from anxiety or panic disorders or CPTSD, like I did and most of my clients, that you have to start to tend to your body and it'll be a healing process, a physical healing process after you leave. Amazing. And such good feedback. And so you mentioned the masterclass. So where can people find you? What are your platforms? Because I know that there are people listening right now that would benefit from some coaching that would benefit from some master classes, where can they find you? And what are some of the things that you're working on right now? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on Instagram. It's love bombed MD. Um, I right now, I just did a master class on Thursday. I'm actually going to be launching a four week course. That's going to dive into right when you leave the narcissist, what comes up, smear campaigns, how to trust yourself again, how to regulate your body and bring your body back to safety. And a lot of things when it comes to just leaving the narcissist and what you'll encounter right after that. So that's in the works. I'll probably be launching that within the next two weeks. And then I have a course called Love Alchemy that I'll actually be launching. It'll be more of a self-paced, but I'll do live group coaching calls with you all. And we're going to go through the whole gamut of healing from the narcissist and then finding real safe, conscious love afterwards. So that's actually coming up. That's going to be within the next month or so. Um, but right now, if you want to just follow me on Instagram at lovebombedmd, I'm constantly sharing like free content and really trying to get, get everybody to the point that they feel validated in their experience because going through narcissistic abuse is very isolating. And a lot of times you're like, nobody would believe this if I told somebody what I went through, you know? So that's basically what my space is for now. Um, I'm not currently doing any one-on-ones. Um, I may open up some space for that in the future. But if you just go to my page and to my link tree, there's some free resources. And then in the next two weeks, I'll be launching a new a new four-week course. So. Awesome. Yeah. And definitely follow her because I follow her and there's so much great content and so much that you can learn. And then if you see something that you want to participate in, I 100% encourage you because you have to take control over your own growth. You have to put in the work. And this is part of putting in the work is really understanding and growing and healing. So Megan, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so humbled for you coming on the podcast. This was healing for me. So I, oh, I think this is you. such great information and so many of my listeners are going to get so much out of it. So again, thank you. Thank you. And yeah. of course, to all my listeners, um, thank you so much for all the reviews that you guys have been leaving. Please, if you like this episode and you know that there's someone out there, maybe a friend or a family that would benefit from listening to this or that if you know someone who's in a narcissist relationship, please share this and share Megan's information. And until next time, see you on the next episode of Diary of an Empath. Mm -hmm.